I've looked forward to the summer concert of buzzes, clicks, and chirps since I was a kid, but I've only paid close attention to singing insects for the last few years, so I am no expert. I want to admit right up front that I relied heavily on many online resources in preparing this presentation. A number of those resources will be shown at the end if you are interested in learning more. Every good story needs to include some basic information. To make sure I cover it all, I will use the old five W's and an H to organize my topics. All of these will be addressed, just not exactly in this order. To start with, we need to know what in the world are we talking about. A signal is an act or condition that conveys information from a sender to receivers of the same species. Most often, their purpose is to have an effect on the behavior of the receivers. Communication theory holds that signals develop when both the sender and receiver benefit from the interaction. This leads to a signal and its response evolving together in a population which recognizes and shares a meaning. Insects dominate the world. The number of insect species far overshadows all other animal groups combined. Research in recent decades, especially in tropical forests, has added thousands of new species every year, and this trend is expected to continue. It's thought that less than half of all insects have been scientifically described, although a few experts feel that there may be many times more insects yet to be discovered. Insects are equally overwhelming in terms of abundance. We can visualize their vast numbers this way. For every one of the nearly 8 billion people on the earth, there are a billion billion individual insects. Within this tremendous diversity, insects developed many ways of transmitting signals. Information can be shared between individuals in direct contact with each other. The most elaborate example of this is the waggle dance that honeybees perform in the hive to convey direction and distance to a promising source of nectar. Visual signals come in many forms. Color and pattern can convey a wealth of information between members of the same species. First, of course, is that they are the same species. These features may also reveal the gender, age, and even availability for mating of an individual. Warning signals are often meant to carry messages to other species. It might advertise toxicity or simply be to frighten away potential predators. Most of us probably know that male fireflies flash to advertise for a mate. Did you know that their larvae also use bioluminescence to let their predators know they are distasteful? A few other insect groups use the same messaging system. By far the most common method of communication among insects is chemical. The release of volatile substances is critical for finding mates among many orders of flying insects. Leaving chemical information on surfaces for others to follow is found among non-flying groups, such as the ants that find their way into our kitchens. But which insects sing? Amazingly, sound communication among insects is very rare and mostly limited to two groups. The order Orthoptera has more than 25,000 species worldwide, which are organized into six suborders. Only two suborders have members that sing, crickets and grasshoppers. And within these, only four families have this ability. Characteristics shared by singing Orthopteran families include long hind legs that are modified for jumping, usually two pair of wings, with the fore wings slender and hardened at the base, and hind wings that are wide and membranous, and which fold up like a fan under the forewing when at rest. They have gradual metamorphosis, with immatures looking similar to adults, and which share the same habitats as adults. All life stages have chewing mouth parts, so it's not surprising that these groups include some major crop pests. 
The order Homoptera includes more than 32,000 species, and all of them have piercing-sucking mouth parts specialized for feeding on plant tissues. This order contains aphids, leafhoppers, and scale insects, along with many other serious pests. Only one family in Homoptera sings. Over 3,000 species of cicadas have been described. They are mostly found in the tropics. Many species have restricted ranges wherever they occur. The characteristics of cicadas include two pair of wings that are held tent-like over the body, with all wings membranous, and the hind wings shorter than the forewings, prominent eyes set widely apart, and a pair of short antennae. This family also has gradual metamorphosis, with development from egg to adult taking from several to many years. Nymphs dwell in the soil, sometimes to great depths, where they feed on plant roots. Before shedding the final immature skin, they emerge from the soil and crawl up nearby surfaces. Adults live only about a month after emergence. First, we'll look at three of the orthopteran families that all sing in the same way. Grillidae is the large family of typical looking crickets. Members of this family are found from 55 degrees north latitude to 55 degrees south and from treetops to deep underground. Grillotalpidae is a family of about a hundred species. As the name implies, the front limbs of mole crickets are modified for digging and these insects live underground. They are unusual in that both males and females produce sounds. This may be for group communication because parents stay with and care for the eggs and young. Tetagoniidae is a large group of long-legged and large winged insects, also called longhorn grasshoppers, for their very long antennae. They are predominantly green, with a few of the species having brown color morphs. More rarely, pink or yellow morphs may show up in dense populations of some species. These three families sing through stridulation, which is the production of sound by the passage of one body part over another. Many animals stridulate, such as spiders rubbing their legs together or snakes rasping one row of scales across another, both of which are used as threat displays. These insects have rows of hard teeth near the base of the forewings. An area called a file is on the lower surface of the upper wing, and a scraper is on the upper surface of the lower one. To sing, a male raises his wings, then opens and closes them rapidly. The file passes over the scraper, which emits a pulse of sound during the closing stroke. The teeth are separated during the silent opening stroke. The rate at which the teeth strike the scraper determines the pitch of the sound. The pitch is usually expressed in kilohertz for the dominant frequency produced. Here are the files from two related field crickets. The species with the more densely packed teeth has a higher pitched call than the other. The number of teeth ranges from as few as 10 up to 1300 among different species. So calls can be pitched as low as 1.5 kilohertz to well over the range of human hearing, which tops out at about 20 kilohertz. Song structure is determined by how fast the wings are opened and closed, or stroke rate, and any pauses between groups of strokes. Stroke rate varies greatly between species, from once every three seconds to more than 200 times per second. In many species, stroke rate slows down as the temperature decreases, but even then, the overall song structure remains the same. These are calls from seven closely related species. The sonograms show that each has its own pitch and pattern. A song is so characteristic that it can be used to identify a species. In fact, the lower two songs in this diagram are the only way these two species can be told apart, as no morphological features have been found to distinguish them. So basically, these three families sing from their backs. Maybe it shouldn't be surprising, then, that their ears are on their knees. A thin membrane on the upper tibia, called the tympanum, covers the opening of an air-filled passageway.
This extends up the leg and connects to the acoustic spiracle, one of the breathing spiracles in the thorax, which opens to the air through a pore. As a result, the tympanum flexes in response to pressure waves in the air from either side. This provides the insect with good directional hearing. Tympanums are found on both males and females as they both respond to the calls of singing males. Let's look closer at a few species, starting with the true crickets. There are 112 species in North America, which fall into four subfamilies that occur in our region. We'll look at a few examples of each subfamily. Field crickets are robust black insects with round heads that may invade our homes in the fall. The spring and fall field crickets look the same and sound the same. The spring field cricket overwinters as a nymph, so matures earlier in the year. Like most orthopterans, though, the fall field cricket overwinters as an egg, not maturing until summer. Both species can be found around our buildings, just not during the same season. The eastern striped field cricket has a warm brown and cream pattern. It's found in grassy or weedy areas where its weak call does not travel far. Ground cricket adults are tiny and may be mistaken for baby field crickets. These small black or dark brown insects are difficult to tell apart visually, but their loud musical trills vary considerably in rate and quality. The striped ground cricket not to be confused with the eastern striped field cricket, is found in damp, grassy, or weedy areas near water. Allard's ground cricket is a small, dark insect that prefers dry, open, grassy areas. It may be common in lawns and roadsides from where it moves into buildings in the fall. An early entomologist confused this species with the abundant Carolina cricket, so it was named the Confused Ground Cricket. It's found in damp leaf litter under hardwoods. Tree crickets generally have broad transparent wings which they hold vertically to sing. Nymphs tend to be pale greenish white. The adults are less than three-fourths of an inch long and both tend to stay high in vegetation, so they are often hard to locate. The best time to find them is after a rain washes them from the trees. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, If moonlight could be heard, it would sound like the snowy tree cricket. This species is also called the thermometer cricket, as its call can be used to tell the temperature by counting the chirps in 13 seconds and adding 40 to get degrees Fahrenheit. Just to show there is some merit in this, here is 5 seconds from a cold, snowy tree cricket. and five seconds from a hot one. The two-spotted tree cricket is the largest of the subfamily in the eastern U.S. It range extends at least as far as my home in Washington County. It is usually well off the ground in dense stands of young trees. The blackhorn tree cricket is unique by being heavily marked with black. It favors brushy fields, roadsides, and bramble thickets. It's found throughout Iowa, but its distribution west of the Missouri seems to be in doubt by some authorities. It's certainly one we should have our eyes out for. This group of tiny one-fourth inch long crickets are easy to miss. They are sometimes called winged bush crickets, leaf running crickets, or sword tailed crickets. All those names are bigger than the insects, so they are most often just called trigs as shorthand for the subfamily name. Say's trig, named after Thomas Say, the early naturalist, has a particular fondness for locust trees in tall, weedy, or grassy areas. Hundreds may be found in a single small tree. The sharp three-color design of this insect makes it clear why it's called the handsome trig. It's found throughout Missouri, but not here yet. 
I think it's one we should watch for as changing climate conditions may encourage its spread. As it favors brushy hedgerows and Japanese honeysuckle, there would seem to be no lack of suitable habitat here. Only one species in the family Grillotalpidae occurs in this region. The northern mole cricket is found along the damp margins of streams, ponds, and floodplain wetlands. Males call from a closed burrow. Their calls are still loud enough to be heard above ground, but difficult to locate. After mating, the female may forcibly evict the male, seal up the burrow, and tend the eggs and young. Although they look pretty fearsome, they are harmless to handle. The Tetagoniidae family includes the star singers among insects. In contrast to crickets that have the right wing uppermost, all the katydids are left-handed singers with the left wing on top. Most species overwinter as eggs, so their loud choruses don't tune up until late summer. There are five major subfamilies that occur in this region. First is the true katydid group that gives the family its name. There is only one widespread species in North America, the common true katydid. They may spend their entire life in the same tree, usually oaks in this area, because they don't fly in spite of having well-developed wings. These wings serve as resonance chambers that intensify their calls. They only sing at night, producing choruses that drown out all other sounds, and in my experience, they can occasionally be painfully loud. The false katydids include about 65 species in North America, organized into 12 genera. Many have limited ranges in the west or southwest. In this region, we have a number of widespread eastern species, mostly in the genus Scuderia, or bush katydids. These are slender, leafy green, and difficult to tell apart. The best way to identify species is by examining the terminal abdominal structures of males with a hand lens. Of course, there are subtle differences in their songs. The oblonged wing katydid... is the largest member of the round-headed katydid genus. I often find these in my yard and hear their calls along the weedy edge of my woods at night. Pink or yellow individuals may be found in dense populations. The forked tail katydid has a very simple call which it produces from bushy areas. The Texas bush katydid has two songs produced both day and night. One is a brief rattle, the other a longer series of notes which is given less often. This bush Katie did is easy to capture once it's located. Curved tail Katie did produce a song with two repeating phrases. The second always has one or two more pulses than the first. It's found in weedy fields and wood edges. The meadow katydids are the classic longhorn grasshoppers because of their extremely long filamentous antennae. As the name suggests, they generally frequent open grassy areas. The 39 North American species are divided between a genus of small to medium-sized insects and another genus of large ones. We'll look at two members of each. To me, many of their calls sound like poorly functioning lawn sprinklers or alarm clocks. The slender meadow katydid is pretty easy to identify by the long wings but its small one-inch size and soft high-pitched song makes it difficult to find. Also, the range covers much of North America, but it's somewhat colonial with an uneven distribution. The gladiator meadow katydid is aptly named as it is stocky and robust with red eyes which adds to the menace. 
It frequents tall grassy habitats often near water. The very colorful black leg meadow katydid is found near the edge of wetlands and cattail marshes. Although the name of the woodland meadow katydid may seem like an oxymoron, it does prefer weedy areas with saplings that are located near woods. This is a small, robust insect that is cold tolerant and may be found well into the fall. I have to admit, this group always makes me think of Saturday Night Live skits with Dan Aykroyd. Most of the 22 species of North American conehead katydids are southeastern with a number of them confined totally to Florida. The few species in our area are in the Neoconocephalus genus and are about two inches long as adults. They frequent tall grassy areas, weedy fields, and shrubby edges. The Nebraska conehead demonstrates key features of the genus. In addition to the face slanting sharply backward, there is a conical projection on the forehead. The size, shape, and amount of black on the undersurface of the cone define separate species. Several have both green and brown color morphs in the same population, which may prevent predators from developing a stable search image. Finally, their songs are loud, penetrating, and not really musical. Despite its name, the Nebraska conehead is an eastern species only barely making it into Nebraska. Round-tipped coneheads are the last to start singing in the fall. They sing from late afternoon into the night along roadsides and pastures. Their range also just barely extends into this area. The robust conehead is the largest of the genus, reaching up to three inches in length. It has a correspondingly robust call that is often heard along country roads at night, even inside a closed vehicle. The sword-bearing conehead is named for the long ovipositor of the female. Their shuffling calls start at dusk and continue through the night unless temperatures drop too low. Shieldback katydids are named for the shield-like pronotum that extends to cover the top of the thorax. With their robust bodies, they are the tanks of the family. This is a diverse subfamily with 123 species in North America. Only 10 species occur in the eastern U.S., and none of those reach our area. One of the few shieldback species we might find here is the Mormon cricket. This flightless species prefers sagebrush range and grasslands. East of the Rockies, Mormon crickets are solitary and cryptically colored brown or green. West of the Rockies, it is gregarious and may build up huge populations that swarm across the landscape as a black wave advancing more than a mile per day. Let's look at the fourth family of singing insects in Orthoptera. Acrididae is the large family of short-horned grasshoppers. There are over 10,000 species worldwide. Only about 620 are found in North America. Many species occur in the west or southwest as these are insects of grasslands and rangelands. As the common name implies, they feature short antennae and almost all have well-developed wings. Most grasshoppers, though, do not produce sound. The two subfamilies that do use different mechanisms than we have already seen. These two groups are the slant-faced grasshoppers and the band-winged grasshoppers. Not all slant-faced grasshoppers produce sounds. Those species that do also stridulate, but with different body parts than crickets and katydids. There is a line of stiff pegs running along the inner thigh on the third pair of legs.
This functions like the file as it passes over an area on the upper wing that has hardened and raised veins, which functions like the scraper. The rasping sounds produced when the grasshopper rubs its legs up and down against the wing is fairly soft and does not carry very far. The ear, or tympanum, is also in a different position. It's above the base of the hind leg on the first abdominal segment. The marsh meadow grasshopper is a widespread species in this group, which can be found in moist areas with tall grasses. Like a few other species in this subfamily, females also produce sounds using the same mechanism as males. Bandwing grasshoppers may be the easiest sound-producing insects to find. The Carolina grasshopper is partial to dry, barren areas, and great numbers can be flushed along trails or dirt roads at this time of year. Their mottled colors are excellent camouflage, so they stay put until nearly stepped on. Bowles grasshoppers are similar, but with a preference for dry, sunny woods, where their striped wings are also highly cryptic. Most species in this subfamily have dark bands across the hind wings that are only displayed during flight. The sound from this group is produced by crepitation. The sound is made by the wing membranes as they snap taut when the insects take flight and during courtship display flights. The crackling, buzzing, or ticking sounds have a broad frequency range and are more of a noise than a song. Males and some females crepitate in flight and also stridulate when perched. Instead of a row of pegs on the inner leg like the slant-faced grasshoppers, the hardened pegs are on the forewings. None of the sounds produced by bandwing grasshoppers has much carrying power, and they are not often heard. Finally, let's turn to that one family of homoptera that sing. Cicadas are large insects that share a distinctive body plan. Nearly 200 species are scattered across North America. Many have ranges restricted to just one or a few states of the South or Southwest. There are about 11 species in the greater Omaha area. Several of these will call from the same trees at the same time, producing loud choruses during hot summer days. Some may wait until dusk to call, but none will continue once it's fully dark. Almost all cicadas produce their call with a pair of organs called timbals, located inside the first segment of the abdomen. Timbals consist of a thin membrane with thickened areas called ribs. Muscular contractions flex the ribs and presses them together. This produces a sharp sound. When the ribs are released, they snap back into shape, emitting another sharp sound. The compression and release is repeated 300 to 400 times per second to produce the buzzing songs characteristic of cicadas. The two timbals emit sounds at wavelengths that are additive, thereby increasing the apparent loudness with little extra energy input. The tympanum, or ear, is located on the lower part of the second abdominal segment. In some species, the males are insensitive to the wavelength of sound they produce, presumably to avoid damage from their own songs. Female tympanums are finely tuned to the wavelengths of their species. Among many species, females also produce sound by flicking their wings as part of courtship behavior. In the chorus cicada from New Zealand, males combine both methods. The loud buzz is audible at great distances, while wing snapping is used to signal nearby females. Most cicadas are considered annual species. Although it takes several years for individuals to mature from egg to adult, growth rate is weather dependent so individuals are not synchronized and some adults emerge every year. The annual cicada species occupy all habitat types from deep woods to open grasslands. By just giving a listen, it is possible to find cicadas almost anywhere in our area. 
The scissor grinder cicada sings a pulsating song from late morning to dusk in deciduous woods, parks, and suburban areas. It was clearly named for its easily recognized song. Linny cicada is also found in woodlands, parks, and suburban areas. Its song starts quietly before building in volume and becoming a rattle that resembles a salt shaker. Walker cicada is found near streams and other water bodies where it sings from small willows. It has an unusual song that alternates between pulses and smooth trills. Neighboring males sometimes synchronize their singing. The giant grassland cicada is found among the short vegetation of prairies and meadows. It is one of several western grassland species found in our area. There are seven species of periodic cicadas in eastern North America. Four have 13-year cycles and three have 17-year cycles, and each has numerous regional broods that emerge in different years. All species are black with red eyes, orange legs, and orange wing veins. After their lengthy development, adults emerge in May or June and live only a few weeks. During that time, males form huge choruses high in trees which attracts females. A male flies between perches within the group until he finds a female. The female signals her interest by snapping her wings. In response, the male switches to a courtship song. She continues flicking her wings to guide him to her location. Finally, while he consummates the act, he sings yet a third type of song. This area had an emergence of 17-year cicadas in 2015. The next one won't be until 2032. If you can't wait that long to experience this wonderful natural spectacle, Brood 10 is due in 2021, and Brood 13, along with Brood 19 of the 13-year cicada, both of which include parts of eastern Iowa, will emerge in 2024. Why do a few insects sing? Like so many of an animal's actions, it's mostly about sex. The purpose for singing is to attract other members of the same species. Most often that means attracting females as potential mating partners. When a female approaches, males either fall silent or switch to a courtship song to encourage the females to be receptive. This is common among Grillidae with courtship songs that differ greatly from the calling songs. In some species, females respond with short ticks or chirps, but nothing at all that would be considered a true song. At this point, male crickets and katydids also vibrate their bodies, a behavior called tremulation. This helps the female to properly orient her body for sperm transfer. Calling songs also attract other males, and a variety of behaviors can result. The best examples are the dense aggregations of 17-year cicadas just mentioned. 
Songs can also optimize spacing between neighboring males within suitable habitats. Rather than producing dense choruses, the resources are allocated among participants. Females attracted by the combined songs then have a choice among the available males, so this functions much like a lek used by some birds. Males in close proximity may be stimulated to sing by calls of their neighbors. When males call in unison, the apparent increase in loudness may benefit them all by attracting more females. Here, several common meadow katydids sound much like a single caller. Or calls may alternate among neighbors, producing a cascade from one male to the next to the next. The common true katydids actually do both. Males alternate calls with their neighbors, which are then in synchrony with the next one along the line. Well, insect sounds are about sex mostly, but not completely. Males challenge each other with ticks, chirps, and snaps. This is most common among ground-dwelling species such as crickets. A few species also emit distress calls. For example, true katydids may squawk when you handle them. Cicadas emit loud rattling alarm calls when disturbed. A few males have learned to use these to scare other males off, thereby reducing the competition for nearby females. I want to reframe the how question a bit. Finding insects means knowing when and where to look. The question of when is really what time of year and what time of day. Here is a very generalized summary of my observations in this area. And remember, I've only paid close attention for a couple years. A few species, mainly among the Grillidae, overwinter as adults and can start calling early in the spring. But most singing insects have to complete their full development before maturing in summer. Then most adults only live for a further few weeks. Therefore, the peak season for singing insects in this area is from late June through August although there may be a few insects singing during any part of the frost-free seasons of the year. The time of day a species sings is related to its habitat, so this answer does double duty by also addressing where to find singing insects. Among the orthopteran families, those frequenting grasslands, open areas, or living on or in the ground sing both day and night. Tree crickets, coneheads, true katydids, and false katydids are heard at night calling from woody vegetation ranging from shrubby borders to treetops. This is apparently in response to predation pressure by birds. Presumably males singing from elevated spots during the day are easier for birds to find. Of course, there are exceptions, with mole crickets calling from underground only at night and cicadas calling from trees during the day. Now that you've learned a bit about singing insects, how can you put that to use? Singing insects can be enjoyed passively by just finding a spot outside to sit back and listen. Or if you wish, some singing insects can be brought indoors. This has long been a practice in Asian countries where crickets and katydids are highly valued. These groups tolerate captivity and do well on a diet of lettuce and other vegetables. However, true katydids or coneheads should be avoided due to their loud, harsh calls. If you prefer to study the singing insects in their homes instead of yours, a few basic collection tools will come in handy. Some type of net is needed to catch species that quickly jump or fly out of reach or out of sight. A beating sheet can be used when shaking insects from branches or for sifting through leafy surface debris. A magnifying lens will help to see features necessary for species identification. Several may be useful, depending on how serious your pursuit of singing insects becomes. If you want to invite some species into your home on a permanent basis, specimens obtained for personal collections usually do not have an adverse impact on local populations. There are also a few technological tools useful for the study of singing insects, starting with that cell phone in your pocket.
It's handy for quick photos, audio recordings, and videos. Or to take it up a notch, recording equipment used with other wildlife can be used for singing insects. As loud, mixed choruses of species can be overwhelming in the field, I make audio recordings to sort out the species using Raven Light. This is free sound analysis software from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Although intended for studying bird calls, I find it works just as well for frog and toad calls and for singing insects. It provides a way to visualize sounds and isolate calls of single species for identification. Here, the left panel is the audio profile from the short clip just shown. By comparing it to recordings for species which might be in the same habitat, it confirmed that Nebraska coneheads were calling loudly in the background, and it also identified the insect giving the faint shuffling call as a sword-bearing conehead. As stated at the beginning, I'm a novice in my understanding of singing insects. My goal for this presentation wasn't to tell you everything about them, but my hope is that you will tune into the sounds that have always been the background of summer and just maybe get a little excited about them. As I wrap this up, there's just one more question. How can you start finding and enjoying singing insects? That's easy. Just step outside and listen.